So we enter week two. Is it coming up? There we are. Week two of Jonah. This is this great story that we all know so well and so little. These very three very simple verses of this person are held up to us to reflect about who God is and who we are and who we're to be and what God thinks about this world and people in this world and his call upon our lives. As we dig into this passage, I want to remind you that every time we approach Scripture, we need to approach asking the Spirit, what are you saying to us? Who are you, God? Who are you calling us to rise up to be? And where do you want us to participate? So if you would tolerate, let me read these three verses again. The word of Yahweh came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to for Tashish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tashish to flee the Lord. Now, if you weren't with us this past week or you didn't watch it online, here's this fellow whose faith as a Jew is quite immature. He thinks that Jeroboam, king of the northern kingdom of Israel, was a good king because economically the place was doing pretty well. But spiritually, the place was dying. And they were worshiping gods that weren't gods. They were gods of stone. They were forgetting about God, and they were living life through the pragmatics of that day. They were even beginning to adopt the gods, small g, of Assyria, which were quite evil. So this passage here of this fellow who goes the exact opposite direction to what he would have said was the end of the earth. Tarshish, west of Gibraltar, the Atlantic side of southern Spain. The author, in just a couple of verses, with great skill and simplicity, captures the words juxtaposing divine call, mortal flight, running away from God. It's a very conventional, prophetic beginning. The word of Yahweh came to the prophet to go do this. This divine communication. Now, to be honest, we don't know how he came. Skywriting? Face on the toast? We don't know how God called him, but Jonah had no mistake that it was God calling him. He very much understood that it was God telling him to go. And he went the other direction. You have to understand Jonah in the framework of two other prophets of his day. The first one was the prophet Amos to the nation of Israel, who was rebelling against God just like Nineveh was. They had not reached some of the same depths of moral deprivation or evilness, but they were going the same direction, being the same rebellious, embracing pagan gods as Nineveh. Amos was giving this same message, repent or God's going to judge you. We know that they didn't repent, and 20 years later, the Assyrians, the Ninevites, marched on the northern kingdom of Israel and took it down as he was making to Nineveh. It's also the same time that the prophet Hosea wrote his prophecy. And if you've ever read Hosea, it's not theology. It's not inf more information about God save this is really an emotional letter of a lover whose heart is wrenchingly broken because his lover has abandoned him. And when you read Hosea, Hosea trying to speak to Gomer gets blurred and it's almost like a well done creative movie where it goes from Hosea speaking to God speaking to Israel back to Hosea speaking to Gomer. And it blurs back and forth in the turn of a phrase, it's God, it's Hosea, it's God, it's Hosea. That God's heart for the world and for people and God's own people aren't being who they're called to be. 
You see, Israel was called to be a light, to be salt, to be a sweet fragrance, to be the ones who drew the world to know the living God. And they weren't doing that. Jonah's the only prophet sent to a pagan Gentile people, a people that collectively all of Israel thought was beyond belief, beyond redemption, beyond God saving them. This unique call to these people. But it's interesting that Jonah thought Jeroboam was good. The pragmatics of right here and right now, uh, we reason in our mind, it makes sense to us of what God should be doing and what's good. We often think that if our economy is going well, if a politician manages a pandemic well, then they're God-ordained and they're great. Even if maybe, possibly, they lead people further from the living God. You see, we always interpret our reality is the Disney princess. It's all about us right now. The story is centered around us, not around God, not around what God is doing. And with that comes some entitled rights. This nobody thought that the pragmatic worldly threat of Nineveh, Assyria, to Israel was more important and outweighed what God said. That the control of it is better determined by him, not God. And that God's patience with Nineveh was unwarranted. You know, we're funny beings. Here's where I begin to pick up Jonah's mirror. We want God to be patient with us in our sin. We don't want God to be patient with our enemies. We want him to judge them. I'll tell you, I have little patience for ISIS and the Taliban. In my heart, I'm supposed to want the gospel to come to them. But if I ask my heart, actually, I don't. Boko Haram, the Burmese army, yeah, I could go on with that list. To choose and let God be God and do it his way and trust him when they don't deserve it is so hard. It's interesting in this passage, that first word, go, to the great city of Nineveh, is the very same word used, but Jonah ran away because it works better in English. But basically the same word is used where go is means, literally word is arise, get up right now, don't waste one moment, get up right now, hurry to Nineveh. Because your wickedness has come up and my patience is bowed at its end. So he got up and arose and immediately went the opposite direction. The interesting part with Abraham here, Abraham was told that God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham pled with God to be more patient. God, if there's 100 righteous people, would you not destroy it? Okay. God, I don't want to be presumptuous. If there were 50 righteous people, would you not destroy it? Okay. God, I'm not trying to push it here. If there were 20, okay. God, please be patient with me one more time. If there's 10 righteous at Abraham's heart, the story's for another day. But Jonah knew Abraham's story. He knew about Sodom and Gomorrah. And he wouldn't do it. He said, no, nah, I, I, I turn them all. Burn them all. Don't care. But Jonah ran away the opposite direction. The interesting thing of Jonah in this situation is that he actually ran from God. And in his immaturity, he knew God's character in heart. And he hated the idea of it. And he wouldn't do it. His decision wasn't a flash of the moment. He got up, traveled to Jaffa, bought the fare, got on the boat, and never said, hey, hold on, hey, that ship's going back to Portland, I'm going to get off and get on that one, hit y'all. And worldly understanding of the immediate, overrode daring to trust God beyond the pragmatic. Now look, it's easy to sit here and judge this guy. It's easy to sit here and think ill of him. Last week, knowing where it fit in history, last week, seeing the big picture of Syria, it's easy to judge him for not trusting God because we know the end of the story and that they repented and we actually even after the Ninevites defeated Israel. But the challenge of the scripture is to hold up the mirror and find ourselves in the image of Jonah. The Holy Spirit speaking to us right here and now. And rather than taking what we are so good at doing in the West, of taking this lesson that God's talking about and holding it at a distance from ourselves and turning it around and examining it in an academic way, 
like a 17-year-old in the first year of university having the ethics morality conversation with two juxtaposed impossible moral choices and wrestling in concrete what you think should happen and be done. We love to do it that way. We don't like three very simple verses being held up for us to see ourselves. You see, he talked like he could run away from the presence of God, but he knew this psalm, Psalm 139, and it begins with these verses that basically, you've created me with such great detail and intention. If you look around the church, you'll see these posters. Perhaps we were born for just such a time as this. But emotionally, we act like COVID caught God off guard. That an arising, threatening empires caught God off guard. That threats to our economy caught God off guard. Oh, you got your keys. Good on you, love. Have a good one. But these things haven't caught God off guard. But Jonah knew these verses. If I go to the heavens, I can sit there and reason it, but you're still there. If I get down, you're still there. I go to the lowest places, you're still there. I can't go anywhere. I can't go to Tarshish to get away from you, but I'm going. Have you ever felt so overwhelmed and alone and God so far away and the fear takes over? Have you ever tried to ignore God speaking to you, calling you, inviting you, sending you, and just flat saying no? Has God ever, oop, that one didn't move. There we go. Has God ever called you to love someone that where it's really, really hard? Where there's actually no reason to forgive them and love them? There's none. It's emotive. You feel it difficult. And I'm asking you to go there emotionally because that's Jonah. Jonah wasn't making a pragmatic academic decision. He was reacting out of the rage inside of him. And he would not consider what God had. It was a visceral, emotional, overriding reason. There will be people in this room, people in our church and the other congregations, who've experienced all of that. And when I talk about this, bile starts to come up in their mouth. They can't even, with their mind, their mind starts, the adrenaline, and they can't even think about it. They just feel the emotion of what I'm actually leading them to. They can see what God is calling them to, and it just overrides with that grit teeth, breath held, I'm not going to forgive them. I'm not going to love them. I'm not going to bring grace to them. And it can be bigger things. Anybody remember Rwanda? The Hutus and the Tutsis, 800,000 plus slaughtered. Besides all of those that were maimed. The psychological trauma. The Korean in northern Burma what ISIS and Taliban have done across the Islamic world, as well as the terror in Western nations. You see, the danger of being so angry and bitter against people who deserve your anger and bitterness, there's the key. In our minds, and pragmatically, they deserve it. I get it. You can get to a place where you're never going to forgive them. You can get to a place where you're never going to consider forgiving them, much less liking them, much less praying for them, much less bringing the gospel to them. In our house, there was a time where Australian wine was not allowed. We've spiritually grown. We're not quite to letting South African wine in, but we're working that way. You see, when that bitterness starts to take root and take over, It outweighs us even being able to hear what God's trying to say to us. 
we become deaf to it. We can turn the emotional rules that rule us, and we don't care about the consequences of it. Anybody ever run away as a small child? I did. I made a peanut butter and jelly, plum jelly, sandwich on some bean bread with the edges still on, and I ran away. I didn't know. That's a picture of me, by the way. No. <laughs> you can tell by the beacons of Gondor. No, it's not me. Way too cute for me. I ran away not knowing where I was staying that night, how I was going to feed myself tomorrow, how I would be warm, how I would be protected, any of that stuff. I didn't even have all of my stuffed animals. I had a bag. It was full of stuffed animals, 23 of them. Baby elephant, teddy bears, giraffes, a whale. I'd made my decision. I was just acting. I wasn't thinking it through. I was just going. Because I couldn't understand why whatever small child reality and abuse I was suffering but I was going to run away. And that's what Jonah's doing. And that's what some of us do is we lock God off and we don't want to hear what God has to say and we don't want to do it his way. We just pack a sad and go. Meet Jonah. He ran. He ran and he had all of these great reasons to run. And he had to get to a place of solitude and silence and consequences of his decisions until the fight had gone out of him. Jonah had been shaped by a society around him that considered anybody not Jewish, rather than being a light to love them to the love of God, he took what the society had taught him was true. Stop and think about how that happens now. If you talk to Germans or French or Palms or Canucks or Australians or New Zealanders or South African it, or, or Chinese, it doesn't matter. Each of these people see through the story their societies told them. And we can't dogmatically, we cannot think outside of the water we swim in and what our society tells us. And we function a certain way because we've been trained by that society. And Jonah was no different. The only prophet called... Clearly called by God, he knew it, but he chose not because this society told him to hate them and they're beyond salvation. So what are our blindnesses to how God speaks to how, versus how we think and we won't? We'll dismiss those verses and give some theological reason why they're not trustworthy for our own blinders. Most of my life I've worked with teenagers and young adults. I love it. I still love it. Sometimes they still want to hang out with me. I'm fat, old, not cool, and more, don't care. But they do. But you know what I find? They're going to express themselves and be individuals. And then they run out and they dress in the motif that Fifth Avenue has told them to wear and do to be independent and free thinking. So if you want to be this, dress this way. If you want to be that, dress that way. We've got it prepared for you. You want to pout and be mad at your parents? Do this. You see, societies train us to think and act a certain way, and we don't listen to God above that thinking. Jonah had a damn the torpedoes, full steam ahead. I don't care what the consequences are. I can't even consider it. I will not align myself to what God wants. Even my society backs me, so I'm right. Jonah chose this disobedience and felt justified in doing it. And in doing so, he rejected God being God, lived in overt rebellion, and chose to not know, trust, depend, and much less obey and let God be God. Have you ever done that? As an area of your life where you've reasoned God's wrong, you're right. Do we actually think that in the 21st century we're so much superior to any time before us and we know so much more now that we've got it sorted out?
God created us for a relationship, period. For it to be a relationship, the love from both must be volitional, not mandatory. To be in relationship with God, we have to choose to love God and let God be God. I cannot number the, con- the conversations I've, I've, I've had where people say, why did God let that person do this to me? So I want free will. I don't want them to have free will. Because if they have free will, then they can do something that dishonors God to me and change my circumstances. And God, you're not in control, so I won't let you be in control. I'll be in control. The challenge for us as believers in Jesus, people who follow Jesus as our rabbi, as our Lord, is that you can't live in both worlds. You can't do it with your morality. You can't do it with your thinking and your trust. You can't compartmentalize off part of your life. Women are much less able to function in compartmentalized lives. As soon as you get married, you figure out you now live in an airplane hangar. It's all one giant room and all of life is interconnected. Because guys, we live in compartmentalized mouse mazes. It can be this part of my life and I can just shut that door and it doesn't exist. That works really great in a threatening situation, but in life we do it with our morals. I can live in total rebellion to God in this area, but I can really be the good Jesus guy over here. I can totally treat my family. I can totally do this immorally. I can totally hate this person, but be in church. Have you ever heard of the Hatfields and McCoys? It's actually true. And it went on for scores of years. In the Appalachian Mountains, the Hatfields and McCoys got in some feud. It went on forever. We actually don't know why. But they got to the point, decades later, where to see somebody from the other clan, just see them, you'd try to kill them and shoot them. From across the valley, you'd try to shoot them and kill them. They hated each other, and they had no idea why. They just hated them. And everybody in your clan had told you to hate that clan. And then they all went to church on Sunday. Separate churches. Smart pastors. But they would not dare think and consider that God might actually be bigger and better and work through it. And Paul here was writing to Corinthians, and it's a great chapter. Read that chapter. But he says, dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. What is an idol? Anything I love more than God. Anything that prioritizes and guides me over God, including myself. I speak to sensible people. And he goes on down at the end of the passage there. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord in the cup of demons. So here's what the Corinthians were doing. They've been in a pagan world. They've become Christians. But they have all these friends. And all these friends would go to this pagan worship and offer these meat and stuff to this demon. This false god. And then they would have this feast together. And everybody would go, oh, it's not big deal. You just go, yeah, I know it's been doing, but we'll just go and participate in it. And they may even do some of their worship while we're there, but we're just there. Inside, I got my fingers crossed. And then they would turn around and go to worship and take communion with God. The pagans fully understood that if you're participating in this, you're taking communion with that God. And then they would come over here and try to take communion with that God. But you remember the prophet Hosea. You can't be mine and volitionally love me and be in relationship with me and whore yourself to another God. You can't do that. How often do we stop listening and become desensitized and get to a place where we justify that? That's Jonah. When I was a teenager, I worked in this very fancy French restaurant. And I figured, well, I don't like washing dishes, I'm going to do this really well and try to aspire up. So I became part of the floor help, kind of that second, you know? And I figured, oh, well, that's a lot of steps. I don't want to work that hard. So they got me on cold appetizers and desserts. That was cool, a little bit of creativity, some good stuff, start learning some things. The chef was from Paris, but he was so French. 
And when you're a Frenchman in a French city, you're so French. And one of his best dishes was beef wellington. Beef wellington. And I used to remind him of Waterloo. <laughs> Not when he had a meat cleaver in his hand. But occasionally I would go, the Duke of Wellington, Waterloo, shut up. And then he would swear at me in French. I learned a lot of great words. One time, somebody asked for tomato sauce for their beef wellington. He grabbed the biggest meat cleaver and was headed towards the door. <laughs> he wasn't faking it. He was going out there and we're holding him back going, no, no, you Maurice, you can't do that. You see, those emotions can take over and you can become desensitized. Something else about Maurice? He handled this hot food for decades, right? He cooked in this kitchen all the time. He was constantly testing. The, the, the nerves were seared in his hands. He couldn't feel it anymore. And it's a great picture of what we do in our hearts, how we sear ourselves to the sound of the Spirit speaking to us, of how we deafen ourselves and desensitize ourselves to God actually wanting us to do stuff. So we get to, we can only see it from our perspective. Meet Jonah. We can only reason it and understand it. And actually, I get to determine whether it's right or not. So therefore, I've broken the commandment of have no idols above God because I'll be God, thanks. Tim Keller. When you love anything more than God. When you don't care what happens to souls. Idolatry. That person's lost something. I won't serve you if it can't be my way. Jonah. And then Paul writes to his young apprentice, Timothy. The Spirit clearly says that in later times they'll abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such things come through hypocritical liars whose consciousness have been seared as with a hot iron. Now, different passage could dig into that one passage for an hour. But real simple. Sometimes our emotions that become that rage from that photo, even when we have good reasons in a human perspective, we can deny God's voice so long. We can choose to live in a sin or have a world view so long, so deep, and we stop listening to the Spirit that we sear our consciousness to even be able to hear Him anymore. It's not a hocus-pocus thing that the Holy Spirit does to you. It's just how humans work. Is there an it that doesn't bother you anymore? I think one of the things, I, I was telling some of the, the young adults, I, one of the things that breaks my heart is not when people are still emotional about why they won't love X people or do something. They've been hurt and they're angry. I can deal with that. You can turn an emotion, a, you know, a, 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 a sailboat under motion can be turned. A sailboat sitting still, it's apathy when people have become so seared, they're just apathetic and they don't care. They just want it their way. They want church their way. They want music their way. They want worship their way. They want teaching their way. They want the programs their way. They want the programs to be for them. You, but you've known me over two years now because I'll also say, that's great, but I'm not going to give you any resources. If you want to get in a circle and hold hands, your group is sterile. It'll never give birth to more children of God. Why would I give it any resource? What is an it, an idol, a God, where your emotions are decided, your worldviews decided, your morality is decided, your theology is decided, that you've taken control? One of my favorite stories is a rich young ruler. He's a Sadducee because he's rich and young. 
So we know that, which means he's very liberal. Define God the way you want to define him. Do it pragmatically, just like Jonah. Got to work with Rome because they're here. And he's standing back and he's listening to Jesus speak, peasant, not accepted by anybody amongst the ruling class anywhere in Israel, Zion, Palestine. And when he finishes and people start to leave, it says he ran down and knelt before Jesus. Rich young rulers don't run down and kneel before anybody, particularly peasant Pharisees that aren't accepted by everybody. But he did, which kind of shows you there's something desperate there. And he he says, good teacher, what do I have to do to be saved? He's actually daring to admit that there's a problem. He doesn't know what it is, but he's admitting it. And Jesus cleverly gives him the commandments that are horizontal. Forgive, love, don't covet, honor parents. And he goes, I've done all of that. I've been religious my whole life. Substantive. Kiwis are good at substantives. I know it's still missing. I'm not saved. And Jesus, rather than quoting the other vertical commandments, says to him, the summation of those commandments, give it all away and come follow me. Sacrifice and kill all of your gods and make me God. In the text, and I love it in the Greek because we miss it in the English, they, they locked eyes and they looked at each other and Jesus loved him. As he looked at him, he goes, this kid is asking all the right questions. He's so hungry and he's daring to ask. This is a moment as we stare eyes and don't say anything and we've got our eyes locked on each other where this one is making a decision about which God. This is great. And you know how it ends? His face fell. Do you know what it means? He broke eye contact. Decision made. I love my gods too much. The things in reality, in value system, in priorities, and how I make decisions, and how I make sense of the world, I love all of that more. I can't do it. And he went away dejected and sad. The challenge of Jonah. By the way, Jesus said to the Pharisees who were the same locked in view of what made sense. He said, I'm not going to do any more signs amongst you. The only sign you get is the sign of Jonah. It's this right now. This is the sign they were giving them. Are you going to let God be God? Or do you have to frame it and make sense of it? So the question, the mirror held up to us again, is, is there something God wants you to let go of or something God wants you to do, some God that God wants you to slay? Does God want you to crawl off the throne and let God be God? Is there something you're caught in, some sin that you've become desensitized to, that you've rationalized Communion with demons and communion with God. Is there something that we just come to God and let God be God and trust Him? Even when it hurts. Even when it hasn't made sense. Even when in a human way, all of the anger makes sense. There's great hope in this passage, though, because God loved even the Ninevites that much. They were beyond salvation. They were seared, but somehow the Holy Spirit broke through, and a number of them at least repented. Next generation didn't, but they did, led by their king. That God was patient enough to send somebody to them. And God, the hope is that God loved Jonah enough. God definitely got him alone. Definitely got him quiet. Definitely stripped him of all the self-reliance. Like the child who's just flailing and you just hug them until it's all spent. And they just 
wrap up in your arms. Those were the best cuddles, I. These deep truths of Jonah, that God, yes, there were consequences for his rebellion, but they weren't consequences to hurt him. They were consequences to save him. And consequences for God to work outside of his expectations to the point that he actually stayed there the rest of his life. I want to close with two quotes. It's by a guy who I still call young. He's about 40, 41 now. Um, Suzanne was an intern in women's ministry at this massive church, 1,500 people of service type thing. I went along one Sunday with her to her church. We're sitting there, and this 16-year-old kid is leading worship. There's playing music, and there's leading worship. There's leading worship, and there's leading people into the presence. And this 16-year-old kid led people into the presence of God. And I sat there literally having to go and pick my jaw up because it was spirit-empowered worship. He went on to be a pastor and plant a church called, you ready for it? The Jesus Church. You could Google it right now, Portland, Oregon. The guy who was my number two at Rolling Hills is now the number two at the Jesus Church, Timothy McDonald. And John Mark has gone on to a church in North Portland, a hard area, spiritually hard area, spiritually Ninevite area, and leading another church there. I'm never good enough to write a book. He says some great things in the six that he's written. I commend this one, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And he says, please endure my reading it. Ultimately, nothing in this life apart from God can satisfy our desires. Tragically. We continue to chase after our desires ad infinitum. The result a chronic state of we keep trying and he keeps getting worse and the cycle spirals out of control. Today is World Mental Health Day. I think that's fantastic. The problem is the hope in health that World Mental Health points people to is go do some mindfulness. Love one another. All great stuff. But it's to not mortify, kill our little G gods, but to take another breath before we go underwater again and try to somehow make sense of life where God is not God, where we continue to be God. So I applaud the desire. I think their answers are meaningless if there's not life breathed into it. And the second quote, if you want to experience the life of Jesus, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. The pathway to life is to do exactly what Jesus did. He submitted himself to the will and the wisdom of the Father and let the Father be the Father. To the point, Elohi, Elohi, Lama Sabathani, why have you rejected me? But he still trusted him that God was actually God in working in something bigger and better than any human could fully grasp. Because we no longer have to do religious rites to somehow try to stave off the judgment of God. That you are forgiven eternally and permanently. It is settled much more than our human lives and our circumstance here, but eternally it's settled that we actually have to follow in the way of Jesus. Obedient, trusting, trusting beyond making sense. Eugene Peterson gave us the great translation, the message. He wrote another book, The Long Obedience in the Same Direction, that you learn to follow Jesus and trust, even when silent, even when it doesn't make sense, because God is working in you and through you for things that are bigger than us right now. Father Maximilian Kolbe, who died in the concentration camps of the Nazis, had no idea he would be an inspiration to people decades later. 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote the great things he wrote, having no idea how it would sustain and buoy the church scores of years later. The Jews had a blessing for disciples. May the dust of your rabbi cover you. May the dust of your rabbi cover you. You get the imagery following so close, even in the dust, to be transformed and like our king. A part, volitionally, of what God wants to do in and through us. Sacrificing all gods to let him be God. Would you pray with me? God, we open our hands to heaven, and as best we can, we surrender our will, we surrender our idea of justice, we surrender our desire to rule and make sense and force you to be framed within our pragmatic idea of what should happen. We surrender our will to not want to do things that are scary or uncomfortable as best we can. Spirit, would you come and work and speak in and through us? God, would you help us to learn from Jonah's words? To trust and follow and hear and not be seared and desensitized, but ever more sensitive to what you're doing and saying. God, we've rebelled. We've confessed that. But sometimes our heart, our teeth are locked, our jaw is locked and gritted and the emotion surges like adrenaline in our bloodstream. Help us to exhale the breath we didn't know we were holding and to release our grip and self-idea of righteousness and not rebel. Help us to be grateful for the good things and to actually see the good things you're doing Help us to see and be grateful for your work and not letting us go, but pursuing us as the hound of heaven. God, remind us that your mercies are new every morning. Your faithfulness, your trustworthiness to us is unrelenting. God, come be God. Help us to align ourselves and yoke ourselves to the way of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.